So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode, another series of the Space for Women show. Today is a very special edition because generally we go live on Saturday, but today we are live on Friday because we have some very, very special guests for a very particular um, event, which is the Moonshot Thinking. So first of all, I will be the host today because the Space for Women show producer, Ti Hien, she will be one of our panelists and she will share with us, with the other amazing panelists and speakers, some of her very uh, insightful thoughts about moonshot, moonshot thinking. So the Space for Women show, as we know, is based upon uh, the latest initiative from NOSA Space for Women Network to work on the SDGs and to bring and enhance the presence of women and girls all over the world into the STEM, especially the space industry. So before we go straight into the uh, into our um, event today, Muncha thinking new business model design uh, in times of disruption. I will then open the floor to our special moderator today, Kevin Allen, part of the OpenXO community, forward thinker, and definitely a moonshot thinker. So Kevin, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bianca. Really great to, to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, as I was saying, as we were speaking before we got going, it's so important that we uh, have more women in leadership around the world. Uh, uh, Salim will speak about that uh, for sure, I'm sure, and, and, and Marga as well. People, uh, it's, it's so important uh, for us to, uh, to, to understand that. So thank you for, for this initiative, for what, you, for what you're doing. Uh, really, really uh, happy to, to be here today uh, to uh, uh, introduce uh, the, the, the speakers who are, who are, who are speaking today. So, uh, so he and uh, uh, will will be introducing uh, uh, the moonshot thinking today, uh, and 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 what that means, right? Uh, ultimately, many people know about uh, the the going to the moon and 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 what was done in order to to do that. But you can have uh, moonshot thinking, and of course, we are going back to the moon uh, uh, in 2024 as well. The first woman on the moon, which is amazing. So he and uh, over to you to to introduce what is moonshot thinking about and 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 what we're going to be talking about today thank you bianca for the opening and thank you uh, our panelists and uh, thank you kevin for moderating today i'm going to just share my screen and i'm going to share just from my personal experience uh what moonshot thinking is you see the screen we do So, um, moonshot thinking. From my pers personal experience, uh, my name is uh, Tihi Anun. I am a UNUSA Space for Women Network mentor. I am a futurist and a social impact entrepreneur. I'm the founder of Space Connects. And, uh, oops, this is Marga. So, this is me. 2012 building uh, this building uh, and then a facility. Uh, it's a health and performance center. Uh, I'm a trained physiotherapist and uh, um, and uh, a personal trainer. Um, anything to do with uh, a physical transformation, health and well-being, that was me. So I built this facility. Uh, with some business partners and comes a couple of years later, um, it was all digitized. Uh, you know, if you learn about Peter Diamandis, who's my mentor, um, about the six Ds, you go to the process of uh, from deception to total uh, decentralization. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, how did I go from a linear uh, business to uh, going global and galactic? So, this is the journey I would like to share with you today. 
So um, I did some uh, programs at the Singularity University. I was involved in uh, the abundance community with Peter Diamandis, and um, that really excelled my uh, moonshot thinking, um, which you know is is like an uh, an operating system, you know, like a new chip implanted into my brain to think differently, uh, how I can go from being uh, uh, someone who trades hours for dollars, you know, and uh, go exponentially. How can I turn my hourly rate, which is pretty good, 150 euro an hour to, you know, to 10 times. So I thought, um, okay, let's uh, look at uh, technology. How can technology help me um, uh, scale? Uh, health and, uh, and and then at the at the point I thought okay I mastered the area of health I was thinking of and started to ask a lot of questions you know so um, uh, so I was thinking okay what is the biggest problem what is what what is a huge problem I would like to solve by that time I already know everything to do with health physicality healing you know, that area of my life I mastered. So I went on and started to ask more questions. What would keep me up at night? You know, um, what, what are the things, you know, you sing under the shower, you talk, sing 24 seven, you talk about it and uh, what makes you so unique that no one else is qualified to do. So uh, the huge problem for me, I was thinking about was, um, you know, um, how, how could I, you know, now uh, uh, contribute to the health of the planet and even take it beyond? And I started to ask questions. Why is technology evolving so fast now? What's the meaning and the purpose behind it? You know, as Peter says, uh, uh, technology is just a resource lab liberating mechanism for, for us to have more abundance, you know, but what is the worst scenario that could happen to our species and to humankind um, if uh, we don't use this wisely? So um, the problem that I was thinking about was, you know, um, that I would hand over the torch. I would know that my children and my uh, future uh, uh, children have enough water and, you know, um, air to breathe. So um, very little did I know that uh, uh, even Peter Diamandis was the founder of the International Space University. So I signed up um, to uh, become an alumni in 2019. Um, and where, um, where there I did the business and management department in the team, team uh, project, a space for urban planning. Um, we, um, I joined ISC and all space conference that I could do uh, to, um, you know, I always believed in, uh, in order to be the best, you have to learn from the best. So if it, if our species would be, uh, is at stake, and if that's something that is emotionally charging you, so go, go out and venture. And uh, then, of course, I looked at, you know, why is Elon and Jeff Bezos, you know, this MTP and that moonshot, it chases you even in your dreams, like literally Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, I had conversations with them, I had aliens coming into my dreams and all of that thing, um, that is very unusual, right? So the, the challenge that I had that there was actually no one there um, who would think like mine and who could be there to help me to converge science, spirituality, technology, and um, and, and you know and, and and energy and all of all of that so i, I stepped into the work of uh, unosa and the un and literally simonetta the director she said without uh space technologies we won't be able to meet our 17 sdgs and as you know the 17 sdgs are uh humanity's moonshots so to speak you know so my purpose was then to uh uh, since no one was there speaking about this, um, I, I thought, okay, let's 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 go go do it and uh, inspire and influence the trans transformation of our future in Earth space, which is pretty much what what Elon Musk is asking for help now. He's building and paving the way. The technology he needs the society. Um, so it's an exciting time to be alive. Um, 
the solution is, you know, we uh, leaders, we must adapt to exponential growth, complexity and chaos as we witness this, this year right now, um, you know, um, but uh, every uh, crisis uh, precedes transformation. Barbara Max Hobart, um, she's unfortunately not with us anymore, but I feel like I carry on her legacy. So, um, so I created in 27 uh, Space Connects, which uh, vision, you know, and mission is to uh, build a large space community to empower 1 billion lives we serve by providing reliable and resources training while paving the way for access and accountability. Um, so the, we would like to transform the future of humanity in earth space movement. Um, through the established permanent human settlement in Earth orbit, evolve, develop space commercial markets, seek discovery, purpose, value, and meaning for humankind. So um, I'm very interested to, you know, expand the consciousness into the cosmos where we came from. Um, so uh, in conclusion, what helped me to find my MTP and moonshot is really, I'll give credit to uh, the Singularity University to my mentor, Peter Diamandis, Salim Ismail, and, um, you know, Maga, and all of these people that helped me, you know, uh, with all of these books. I've, I've been eating them. I, I have zero background in space, but I have read hundreds of books that made me from a nobody to a somebody, which Anusa recognized as, um, you know, as, as, role model in the space and STEM industry to empower women and girls. In conclusion, I would say, um, you know, if you listen to this, um, what really helps you to find your MTP and Moonshot is access and association with like-minded people uh, that share the same MTP, that same impulse, that same excitement. Uh, you, you, you make sure that these people that you associate with are super diverse. Uh, so don't hang out with your entrepreneur friends only or with your government friends, you know, um, share your moonshot earlier than too late. Um, you've been called crazy and I'm still, I still get another message from LinkedIn coming in, you're crazy. So um, uh, that's what I also learned from Peter, share it. If you don't share your moonshot, if you're worried about your IP and all of that, um, you know, we live in the 21st century and accountability, you know. Um, share it, take some risk uh, and make this decision, you know, disrupt yourself, uh, make this different, uh, different decision. I made the decision to sell my business um, and to, 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 to go from linear local to global and galactic. So I, I feel like, um, um, you know, when you share your MTP out there, you know, on social media, whatever, do that genuinely and you attract the right people that will come and help you. And um, they will create this environment for you to safely, you know, build and deploy scale. You know, we did this image is a, is a pitch, you know, it, it was really bad pitch, but, uh, you know, experiment more and fail more. So I hope um, this was a service for you and you can connect with me through uh, normal social media. And uh, if you would like to take things to the next level um, with Space Connects, we're gonna actually train the new species. These programs are coming out very soon. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Ian. That, that, that was really great to see your, your personal story, your personal journey from, from a linear uh, thinking uh, physiotherapist uh, to to a a space pioneer and I in in the world we live in today just because you don't have a degree in a area does not mean you cannot uh, excel in that area there are enough people out there showing us that that is exactly the case and that was a really great intro into the, the next uh, speaker uh, who is Salim Ismail a futurist best-selling author of exponential organizations and exponential transformation I know that Salim will have an introduction with, within his uh, presentation, a, a quick introduction, and he's going to be speaking about space and, and about how we've uh, reached a commercial space industry, uh, really through, uh, you know, through 
people's want and need for that. So Salim, uh, great to have you with us today. Uh, over to you to, uh, to share about uh, uh, the commercial space industry and how Moonshot Thinking got us there. Uh, wonderful. Great to be here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for having me. I think many of you know my background, but let me just share my screen and run you through a few slides. I'm going to talk through what are the technologies that I think we're, 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 we're seeing that will be very uh, meaningful for the, for the space world. Um, the, the, the best answer I've seen about space is, is that uh, best framing I've, I've heard is that, that the sky is not the limit. Uh, and, and that was from Dan Berry, one of our astronaut friends. Uh, we, my, my background, I think you know, I'm one of the founders of Singularity University. Uh, I was the founding CEO, built it out for about seven, eight years. Um, before that, I was the head of innovation at Yahoo, running their incubator. I uh, learned a fundamental lesson that when you try anything disruptive in, a, in an older environment, the, the immune system attacks you. Um, and you get stuck then in a political fight. And our ecosystem is geared now around how do we solve that problem, mostly so that we can actually take on new challenges and new moonshots. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but you know, if you look back throughout our history, we have been using technology as a major driver of human progress. You, you could actually argue it's the only major driver of human progress. And what's really crazy now is we now have a dozen technologies moving very quickly. And it starts from this graph that Ray Kurzweil put together showing that Moore's law, which has been doubling very steadily every 18 months, uh, the price performance of computation, he showed that it went all the way back to 1900. And that once you have that doubling pattern start, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't stop, it just keeps going. And what struck Ray is why is that curve so smooth and so predictable? Uh, we've had wars and recessions and ups and downs in the industry. You should expect a very jagged Kind of stock market shape. And his key observation was once you turn a domain into an information-based environment, the price performance starts doubling. Uh, it actually led Peter Diamandis to write this book called Abundance, charting out that if we could actually harness this acceleration, uh, we'll have an abundance of healthcare, education, clean water, energy, space technologies in about a decade. And what does the world look like if, if that's the case? Uh, Peter, of course, is the head of the, the Ansari X Prize, which many of you know. Uh, Anusha Ansari, who funded the $10 million X Prize, uh, is now the CEO. And what's relevant here is uh, Peter was trying to get into space. And he found that, that he tried to be an astronaut. And NASA said, there's no way you're diligent or disciplined enough. Um, here's your, your goodbye slip. Um, so he figured, let me go to get a private path into space because governments aren't investing in space after the Cold War. So he announces the Ansari X Prize, which was a $10 million prize to go into space. Um, what struck him was that when he read the, <coughs> excuse me, when he read the biography of Charles Lindbergh, was that Lindbergh won a prize for crossing the Atlantic 100 years ago. And it was a $25,000 prize, about $3 million in today's money. And what struck Peter was that it's great that he won the prize, but 25 other teams spent $450 million, sorry, $450 million trying to win the $25 million. So that really blew his mind that you could get a huge amount of R&D. And we know now prizes are really amazing at building this capability out. Um, uh, I'm now on the board of the XPRIZE Foundation, which has some rather interesting characters in it. Uh, pretty much every board meeting starts with what did Elon just do? And, and then we move on to the rest of the business uh, of the day. Um, but this exponential capability that we now have that is infecting more and more domains is I think a really powerful area to look into. Now with today we have a very negative example of exponentials with Corona. Um, uh, it's clear you can see which country leaders, which uh, world leaders understood exponentials and dealt well with the crisis and which ones dealt badly, uh, we, without mentioning any names. Um, our, our, and finally, for the world really does understand the power of exponentials, both negative and positive. We joke that the amount of time spent looking at exponential graphs has grown uh, exponentially. Um, but what's magical on the positive side is we now have a dozen technologies operating on this doubling pattern. And this is something we've never seen before. In the, in the history of our world at any point, maybe one technology was accelerating or another, never have we had this many all at the same time. So for example, drones are doubling every uh, 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 nine months in their price performance. Uh, the sequence at which we can 
sequence the human the speed at which we can sequence the human genome is doubling every six months and so on and and what's dramatic is it's crowd creating a massive crash in the cost of technology here's the cost of light over a, a 700 year period and you can see a very marked collapse in the price of what it took to light up a room or a building same thing with dna sequencing same thing with solar energy uh, and in domain after domain the cost is crashing to zero this is again something very powerful because in the history of our world, it was always true that advanced technologies cost a lot, and only a big government lab or a corporate lab uh, would, would be able to kind of do R&D and launch new products and services in it. Today, for the first time in human history, advanced technologies are very cheap. Uh, the blockchain is open source and free, and this allows a, a total democratization in the innovation cycle, and we're seeing that the results of that today. Um, here's one of my favorite examples. This fishing village in Vietnam had uh, used to get d deliveries of diesel fuel that suddenly stopped and they had no way of powering their fishing boats. So they literally ordered a solar panel, looked up the internet, how to connect it to the propeller and have invented a solar powered boat, right? So here you have cutting edge innovation using advanced technologies at the edge of civilization. Uh, when they get their hands on drones and CRISPR and 3D printed rockets, things are gonna get very interesting uh, indeed. Um, uh, we can see breakthrough innovation like Elon's Hyperloop idea um, and the, the, the ability of a single person to now take on massive infrastructure innovation is something that is completely new. And if you're, many of you are obviously are familiar, he initially wanted to go from at 4,000 miles an hour in 20 minutes from LA to San Francisco. Um, I was actually talking to him about this and I said, Elon, I have a degree in physics. If you accelerate a human being from zero to 4,000 miles an hour and then decelerate them back to zero, you're probably going to kill them. Um, uh, and, and his answer was, yeah, it's an issue. Um, and you know, this is the magical mindset, right? Most of us would go, well, that's impossible. And if you're French, you just say, no, no, pas possible. And you get into this negative frame of mind and he just goes, yeah, it's a problem. We have to overcome that problem. Um, I, I was half right, by the way, you do have to slow down a little bit. You can't go quite that fast. but the concept I think is the important part here. The really magical thing that's happening today is solar energy, which has been doubling every 22 months. Uh, and if you can see the, in the graphs from Ray's book, these, this has been going on for 40 years. And at this pace, we'll be able to deliver all of our energy needs in, on earth in 10 years with solar, uh, which will totally change global geopolitics, right? Um, we're seeing this happen today, about a quarter of the farms in California are solar powered. Um, um, Chile in South America is generating so much solar, they're actually giving it to their neighbors for free. That's happening right now. And in the craziest irony I've seen, the coal museum in Kentucky is using solar panels. Um, and I just don't know how you look in the mirror when, when you see that. But when you see these grand inflection points, you see these uh, what seem nonsensical oddities, which is an indication that we're seeing a big shift. But now we move on to other technologies like 3D printing which become incredibly powerful. This is one of our Singularity teams that launched a 3D printer up to the International Space Station uh, because it turned out the problem we have up on the International Space Station is there's no space on the station because it's full of extra parts. Uh, if, a, if a valve goes bad, you'd better have a replacement. So they um, designed this 3D printer and the major test was, could you 3D print with no gravity? Um, and that was the enormous technical and challenge. They found out it worked and they figured out how to make that work. There are now three, two 3D printers up on the space station. Uh, and in fact, one of them, in one point, uh, one of the astronauts left the spanner uh, down on the ground so they 3D printed it for him. And what's powerful is you can reuse that material and make now a screwdriver or something else. So this gives us enormous enablement and capability in many, many areas. We now, of course, have um, revolution uh, rockets coming out with 3D printed rockets. Uh, Elon Musk with SpaceX dropped the cost of a launch from about 700 million down to 70 million. And so there's a radical 10x drop. But this innovation with 3D printing, most of the rocket parts could drop it down to a few million and take us down another order of magnitude, which again opens it up dramatically. If we go to materials engineering, we're seeing the same democratization. Uh, if you're interested or know anything about construction or material science, you're familiar with what's called Hooke's Law which is stress versus strain. Um, and, and how much can you bend a piece of plastic or a piece of steel before it breaks? 
is the is the calculation. For 350 years, we've been operating on a linear approximation of Hooke's law because we just didn't have the computation to do it in a different way. And now we have computation and we can go into that green part of the curve. And I love this visual because it shows for most of human history, we've, we've been in that little purple bit and now we can go into other places. And this is resulting in unbelievable breakthroughs. This is something called the Materials Project where they've taken half a million compounds and analyzed in great detail whether the electrical, physical, chemical properties of these compounds. So if you're trying to come up with a better battery uh, you might think that lithium air is better than the lithium ion, and you'd spend some time testing that and find that it wasn't quite great, so you'd come back and try another one. And we've been doing R&D on a sequential linear basis, right? Now you can essentially come here and say, I want a, a compound with these thermal properties, these with this much voltage retention, and boom, the database gives you your answer, and here are the five compounds that would meet your needs. Um, this is, by the way, open source and free. Uh, and I showed this to the folks at 3M that got kind of freaked out by this because they have 7,000 researchers um, the, and this kind of renders most of the business model invalid, um, but for the better good overall. Um, another one of our favorite stories, this is E.K. Emiliano Cargiman, uh, no experience in the space sector, designed a nano satellite and he's launched a bunch. One went up, one group went up yesterday, Planet Lab spun off from this similar project. Um, when he's live, he's going to be able to provide real-time video anywhere in the world to a one meter resolution. Uh, so that's kind of freaky at one level, but he's democratizing that so that not just militaries have that capability. Uh, and so we're seeing another example of really amazing breakthrough. Uh, so, and the key part here is that he had no experience in this. He was a computer hacker. And we actually, he actually said, could I talk to some of the NASA engineers to get some feedback on my design? So we got him a half a day with the lead engineers at NASA Ames, uh, spent half a day with the guy. At the end of the half day, we're walking out, the lead engineer at NASA pulls me aside and says, listen, who is this guy? We've never seen his name on any published papers or, his, or any of the kind of bulletin boards. And I said, why? He said, that's the best design of a nano satellite I've ever seen. Um, uh, and so, and, and so I didn't want to tell him that EK had only spent about two weeks in the space domain. Uh, but when you have a beginner's mind and you can come at it with new technologies, whatever you come up with is going to be the best thing ever, right? Uh, that would have probably broken his mind if I told him that. But anyway, uh, so they're kind of launching all their, their CubeSats now and are soon to be in operation. And then we have the ability to actually hack ourselves, which we'll need to do when we're in space. Um, so this guy's getting an injection into his eye uh, of a certain protein that gives him night vision for about eight hours. Um, and so instead of having to carry around really expensive goggles, et cetera, that give you night vision, you can just get an injection straight into the eye and off you go. Uh, that may be a bit queasy for some uh, folks uh, and a little unpleasant, but, but there you go. Um, but I think maybe the most powerful and most important discovery that we've had is that we have found water on the moon. Um, a few years ago, the, we were working with NASA and they actually took us a, a school bus sized satellite that was out of commission and crashed it on the dark side of the moon and did mass spectroscopy on the analysis of the fragments coming off it and found a huge chunk of water on the dark side of the moon, which gives us a fuel source because hydrogen can be extracted from that water. Um, and now we found water on the front side of the moon as well. Uh, you know, when you talk to space geeks, they will say this is the biggest uh, um, discovery in the history of space, because if you can get to that uh, staging point and refuel, you have incredible opportunities from there to go elsewhere. And the moon is relatively easier to get to than uh, many other places, asteroids, et cetera, et cetera. So we're seeing kind of incredible things happen and we're very excited. Down on earth, of course, we have to fix ourselves. And one of my favorite little technology developments has been this. We're using machine learning to understand dolphin language. Um, and they say by next year, we'll be able to hear and understand what dolphins say, which is kind of freaky because what would they say? And we probably don't want to know. So this gives us more and more impetus to get off the planet. Uh, before they really tell us what they're thinking. Um, I hope that's given you some sense of it. I'm really passionate about the space domain because on Earth, we're heading towards Mad Max and we better uh, kind of get to Star Trek pretty quickly. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next few days of the election and the uh, resulting issues that come from that. So I hope that's given you some sense of it. Great to be here, super thrilled about everything going on in your world. Thanks, back to you, Kevin.
Uh, thanks so much, Salim. Really great to to get that 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 bigger picture thinking um, around what's out there. You know, accelerating technologies are amazing, uh, but it's it it's going to take uh, human beings to to turn those technologies into sustainable businesses, to businesses that that actually work, and into businesses that that don't uh, uh, turn our planet into a wasteland. Uh, I. I I, I, I really hope that that the Earth doesn't equal Mad Max, and that that we can uh, we can create Star Trek on Earth as well. Uh, we're now going to go over uh, to Marga Hook, uh, who is a member of uh, Thinkers Fifty. Uh, she is that rare combination of a true visionary and a sustainable business, uh, uh, and ca capital and successful innovative uh, business leader. She understands and applies the commercial realities of business. And she operates at the highest level with ministers and presidents. Uh, she's a voice for the G20, the G7 uh, climate change and COP23, and an award-winning author and a regular contribution, a contributor, sorry, to Huffington Post and other prestigious media. So Marga, uh, very interested to hear what you have to say for us. So over to you. Thanks so much, Kevin. And sounds like I'm always working if I hear your introduction. It's, uh, it's a big pleasure to be uh, with all of you, and even more so because I'm addressing many young women and women entrepreneurs and uh, women with skills to change the world for the better by entrepreneurship and business. So I couldn't have a better audience today. And I couldn't have a better um, person uh, presenting before me because I'm thrilled that you heard all about technology. I'm not sure if I want to be injected in my eye, but well, I'm not an astronaut, so that's a good excuse probably. But allow me to share some thoughts with you about the world. I won't get into the elections today. Let's get some uh, uplifting perspectives. But it's good, it's always good to zoom out, but it's even more important actually uh, to zoom out um, to just see where are we at and what do we need to do. If you see my slides, okay, then we can uh, get started. So a little bit of background about me and preferably I want to share that because with all of you women, ladies, I have been a CEO in several companies in the past, um, predominantly in the construction um, and real estate and spatial development sector. And when I was doing these roles, I was always thinking, okay, we need to survive with our company today, but even more so we need to do in the future. I was always thinking about short, midterm and long-term. And if you think about the long-term and especially in something that concrete as you know, uh, developing and actually making um, buildings, then you see that you need so many resources that you use so much energy and that you throw away so much stuff. So I literally saw that we paid a lot of money to take what we then called uh, waste from our um, building sites and had to pay money for it. And that was one of the moments that I thought, this is not what we want. We don't want waste. We want to recycle. We want to reuse. And also, you know, it's an economic waste to throw things away. So we must be able to develop a business case to reuse things because it's good for the planet. And in the end, it's also good for the company. And just an illustration on how I was actually thinking. And I know many of you do in your own right the same. Um, for me, it was just common sense, to be honest. It's nothing special. I mean, if you can do well by the world by doing good business, why shouldn't you? If there's a business case in it, why wouldn't you? Uh, nevertheless, um, it made me stand out from the crowd, so to say. And um, because of that, I was asked by the Prime Minister to lead the Sustainable Business Association as to enable another dialogue between politics and business seeing how we can, you know, accelerate one and another and move forward much faster. Well, to cut a long story short, um, in that role, I was able to see so many entrepreneurs, so many companies in Europe globally that I feel very privileged because, you know, who is in the position to see so much and thus to learn so much. So I thought, let me share that 
with everybody I know and I don't know. And that was actually the start when I started writing books, uh, articles, doing keynotes around the world. Not because I was... I... Yes. We're still on the first slide, right? Yeah, Just that's saying. correct. I'm sorry. I'll move on. Don't worry. They're getting very worried with my pace. But I thought, let's slow down after you have seen such a paceful uh, presentation before. So that's why I started writing and sharing those stories and how I was able to reflect on it. And I'll share some of those things with you um, today. So you got me off guard. I have to put my glasses on to move uh, to move on. So this is a time, of course, where many are affected by the current COVID crisis. And I want you to just reflect on the fact that it's also uh, a beautiful moment in time where the world actually shows to us that if we really change our behavior, thus our way of doing business, things can change actually quite rapidly. That is one of the messages I wanna to give to you. Don't underestimate your own impact. Your impact will be there. And if we, many of us do that, we'll make a huge change. Now this picture, what you see is the Ganges River in India. And I can tell you for a long time, it hasn't looked like this. It is now clear, clearer than it's been for hundreds of years. And actually the government has spent millions of, of dollars to clear it up. But since we were polluting it all the time, since our behavior didn't change, it didn't get cleared up. And now imagine what, in a couple of months, it's 50% clearer than before. Now, the, I don't say this to depress you, I say this to inspire you so that we realize if we do make a big change, if we create companies, that have a good impact on the world instead of a bad one, mind you how, how fast things can change. And this moment of time, many realize that also cities, cities like in Milan and Istanbul and Amsterdam, for instance, said, okay, we don't wanna go back to usual anymore. We must learn from this crisis and change the world for the better. Now, one of the languages I always use um, because it's so useful are the SDGs. I wrote a book, I'll show you the back um, in the end, which is called The Trillion Dollar Shift. And that illustrates how we can actually relate business to the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals that demonstrate what we need to solve in the world by 2030. They're the successor of what we call before the um, former goals and these are the current goals by 2030. Now what is so great about them because you might say oh god that is so complex 17 goals I mean it's way too much that is all true you should really choose two or three SDGs to focus on in terms of positive impact but realize that in 2015 more than 193 countries agreed on these goals and that means that we said to each other we embrace the fact that commonly we should solve these 17 things. We have agreed on the goals, we have agreed on the underlying targets, and we have also agreed on the underlying indicators. If you don't use the SDGs yet, please download them on, the, on your phone, simply on your iPhone, and you'll have the definitions, you have the goals, you have all kinds of inspirational stuff there. Um, I must say that the United Nations did a great job in marketing them as well. But it's a common language for the world for the first time, regardless of your role, of your country, of your business, or your profession, we all have the same goals, targets, and indicators. So that is something that can create great progress. Now, starting in 2015, which is very interesting, not only businesses, but also countries measured themselves against those SDGs. I don't reckon you can see all the countries here or all the SDGs, and I'm happy to share the link to the actual dashboard information later on, so you can have a look for yourself. But I find it very enlightening to see where the world is at, and these are the OECD countries. And of course, hopefully we're all ashamed we lag behind in climate change and renewable energy, so a lot of red there, but in the beginning of no poverty, et cetera, of course we have quite some green here. But the point of this image is not to show you so much the OECD countries, 
but if I fly through Southeast Asia, you see here, and of course, Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is to realize that entrepreneurs, you know, uh, are seldom stick to one country. We all um, do business internationally. And that means that you can have impact in not only, I'll go through one more time, your own region if it's in the West, but also in Asia and Africa, the countries that really need us to improve the world because the poor are hit the hardest by things like climate change, also by things like COVID. And we are responsible for the world because we're all digitally connected, not our own company, not even our own sector, and definitely not only our own country. So have an impact where you can throughout the world. Now, knowing this, and knowing, for instance, that we have to be climate neutral quite soon in order to achieve that goal of preventing climate change, it is not enough to say, okay, I'm going to be less damaging. I'm going to reduce my CO2 emission. I'm going to reduce the amount of resources I use. I'm going to reduce my packaging waste or anything like that. Actually, what we need in order to achieve that and in order to achieve a sustainable world is that we have companies that actually have a positive impact. Now, if you're at the birthday party and you really want to impress people, you say, oh, I've moved beyond decoupling growth and impact onto recoupling growth and impact. And what do I mean by that? A long time we have said, okay, if my company grows faster, then my negative impact rises, then I decouple growth and impact. But that's not good enough. We need companies that we need more of so that you can say, the bigger my company is, the better it is for the world because in the end, the world is better off by my existence. And this may sound idealistic, but I see many amongst you startups, scale-ups, and also larger companies that get that and also get that there's a business case in that. And one of the guys that started the way of thinking is Ryan Fluff. Obviously, you recognize the ocean cleanup who said, you know, even if we all stop producing plastic and putting it as waste in the sea, um, because it all ends up in the ocean and it stays there because it takes 500 years to get uh, plastic to be dissolved, then still in 2050, we'll have more plastic in the sea than the fish. And that is a social problem. It's a problem for the animals, but it's also a big, huge economical problem. So that is why he designed this to take actually the plastic out of the sea. And that's the same line of thinking. Now, earlier I said, there's a business case in that. And I've been part of the World Business Commission. Uh, we've done all kinds of research and you know, you can, can, can have all kinds of different calculations, obviously, but in the end we came up that it's at least a $12 trillion business opportunity, which concentrated, concentrates for 75%. So, you know, really the majority on four business domains, you could say. And this is additional business because the SDGs, you could also see them as an opportunity as market unlockers, because if we need to solve the problem that many can get education, for instance, around the world, then technology and business have to solve it because governments and, and nonprofits and all, all, all those institutions don't have the means to solve things in, in the world to the extent we need them. So business is actually needed. 69 of the largest economies around the world are in fact businesses. So you are needed to solve it and you can because there's a business case in it. There are four areas which offer tremendous opportunities and I have to mind the time and I'm really bad at that, I'll tell you. Um, so I cannot dive into all these segments right now, but there are four areas that offer tremendous opportunities and, and that, that's obvious, you know, there's a lot needed to happen in cities. We need to cool them. We need to get other ways of transportation. We need to totally build differently. We need to make vertical cities instead of horizontal cities. Same applies for food and agriculture. By now we waste or lose over one third of the food that's actually being produced, that's not consumed 
So that is a tremendous economic waste of around $750 billion annually. So digital solutions that prevent food waste or uh, biological food producers, vegetarian food producers, and so forth and so forth, these are markets that are going to grow tremendously equally energy materials and health and which well-being. So tap in one of those growth areas and you'll stand a chance to have a really good business. Uh, sorry. Uh, these are all elements and I'll, ch I'll share those slides um, uh, after this keynote so you can have a, a closer look. But these are all big chance havers uh, on growth markets within those four domains. So there's a lot of opportunities. Just realize it's not about only finding solutions to problems. There's a lot of business opportunities there. Now, we talk a lot about purpose nowadays, and I realize that purpose is the new, you know, the new word for sustainability. And after a while, we'll say, well, everybody uses it in the way they want to. But let's disregard that. The fact of the matter is that with new generations, and most of you listening will be part of the millennial or even subsequent generations, and by 2025, you'll be the majority, the majority of employees, the majority of the market, and also the majorities of young entrepreneurs. And research indicates, and you all feel that yourself, that these people were, came to the world, they didn't cause any of these climate change issues, but they're, you know, put up with it. So they want to make sure it gets solved and doesn't get worse. And all of you are much more aware of the importance to have a purpose-led company being a company that tries to achieve positive impact in the world, like I just illustrated, is really important. And eight out of 10 of you tend to want to work for a purpose-driven company, tend to be able and willing to pay more for sustainable products and so forth. So it's the future. So also realize that even though at this time you're struggling or you find it difficult to get your business cases done because I'm not telling you it's easy, um, that market you're tapping into is only growing because you'll be where the new generations are. Unfortunately, I don't have time, let me have a quick look, to do a lot of, um, a lot of business cases but it's worthwhile to have a look through and if you if you have my book there's 50 cases in there but they're so inspiring you know there's such great storytelling in these companies for instance interface i don't know if you know them uh um, american listed company by the way so that is never easy um they make carpet tiles they started with a mission zero saying okay we don't want to hurt the world because we're there. So we want to have zero impact. And because they have that such a bold, straight goal, that's another uh, advice to you, always set straight goals, one goal, both goals. Don't do like 6.75 or anything like that. Just zero or 50 or beyond 10, you know, something that is clear to people and inspiring. Because they did that, they achieved that goal much earlier on than they had anticipated. And now they're on their way. Remember the blind slot image with the positive impact? They're on their way to do that. And they have the most amazing projects. One you can read on the slide, climate take back, is that they say, well, there's too much CO2 in the world. So let's embrace that and see if we can make a resource out of carbon. And they make the carbon into granules and use that actually as an ingredient to produce their, park, uh, tar, uh, sorry, to their carpet tiles. And there's many other companies that do that by now. And if many do, then we can actually solve the CO2 problem if we stop causing it, of course. They have another project, it's called uh, Networks, where they said, okay, we are a circular company, but if we wanna grow, we are in desperate need of resources, of course, because only circulating the carpets they have now won't cause the company to grow, obviously. So they collaborated with the Zoological Center in, um, London and found that actually in the Philippines, people just dish their nets, discard their nets in the sea, causing new garbage because they couldn't use them anymore. And to cut a long story short, they collectively bought all of these nets and used them as a resource, giving fair money to the fishermen 
and also using it as a resource for their carpet and so forth. Unfortunately, I'm not able to do um, the other cases right now because then they're going to tell me that I have to stop. So I'll beat them to it. Um, you can read on my website, marcahoop.com. If you click on the button press, you can see a lot of articles. Um, in this book, there's a lot of cases. I go into every of those single uh, markets to show you the opportunities. I think female entrepreneurs often are so courageous and I want to just end with the connotation I dove into the smallholder farmer women in developing countries. And I was shocked by the fact that one, the majority of entrepreneurs is actually women there. And there's only few that actually own the land they work on. So I think besides having our own company and besides growing our own business, Let's be mindful that there are still so many women around the world that deserve a chance, that are well capable, but we don't treat women and men around the world equally still. There's many regions where we need to unlock all the opportunities of women. That is important um, to know too. We have to tap into technology that offers so much. It's not only the fact that by technology we can accelerate solutions for the SDGs, it's also the other way around we can only solve the SDGs by business and technology. I hope it was informative and that I kept within the time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Marga. Uh, it's, it, 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 it was great to hear from you. And, and what, what you've been speaking about here really reminds us that anybody with a moonshot uh, can create a business that is sustainable, that is good for the planet. And, and, and we need to be you know, we need to be doing that. Uh, you know, what you've said, what Salim said, what Hiena said today, you know, really, I think, should be should be giving people uh, a, a lot of uh, positive thinking uh, to, to what is possible. You know, we, we live in an age where you as, an, as people as individuals or as groups of individuals can do what only governments used to be able to do in the past. So it's really amazing. We're going to go into a, a few questions. There've been some questions uh, from from folks uh, watching out there uh, on 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 whichever channel you're watching, uh, the first one is 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 just around um, sustainable business models. So, uh, Marga, I don't know if you can if you can speak to that. Like, what is important when creating a business model that 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 needs to be sustainable? Well. Um... First and foremost, it's important that you, ma that you make a choice. What do you want to do with your business? What are you really good at? What can you offer? And then what of these goals? And these goals are not at the end. They are a means. What goals can you impact positively? And make sure to make a good business description of it. What I notice is that many sustainable entrepreneurs are very heavily on the sustainability, which is, which is great but you have to be equally smart on the business side of matters. You know, you have to make clear uh, what, is, what is the market out there? How quickly can you grow? Um, how much years do you need investment for? How quickly can you be profitable? And also be daring how to collaborate with other businesses. I often see uh, entrepreneurs fighting so hard where it's, if they would think I don't have to do anything myself because we're in a network economy. So for instance, I go to a big company, they have a corporate venture capital fund. If I get my finance there, then that company can offer my product to their clients, thus being good return for them, but I can grow much faster. So it's uh, in my forum and book, New Economy Business, I uh, elaborated on, on, on building business cases in a new economy way. That is very important. Don't do it by yourself. Use the network. Uh, make sure you connect the business case to your sustainability proposition. Make it understandable for others. You might know a lot about your product yourself. Others don't. And be smart how you can grow the fastest because we need growth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and if we shift that a little bit over to, to also looking at the, at, you mentioned getting funding, for example, um, yeah. you know, there, 
there are only a few women you know, out there that have actually been you know, given the confidence and been supported by, by VC uh, sort of capital. So I mean, both you and Salim would, 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 re would like really love to hear you know, your thoughts around that and, and how that relates to, you know, to those business models. So let me go first because I've been talking for a long time now. <laughs> uh, Kevin, is your question why aren't women getting more funding from VCs? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, we don't see many women getting funding from VCs. Why is that? What do we do? How do we how do we improve that? Um, well, there's a big bias around that. Obviously, I think what's what I think what I'm most encouraged by is as we democratize. Uh, all these technologies. It used to be it cost about $20 million to build a Silicon Valley company. And now that's about $50,000. And therefore, people have much more access to capital. And I think you just ride around the traditional um, uh, uh, venture capital structure and investment structure and go straight to crowdfunding and other models to get there. And uh, so when you have smaller amounts of investment needed, you can get going get market traction, and then it, with the numbers and the evidence, it's much easier. And that overcomes the bias that people have. Well, I would like to also uh, turn it around a little bit. I was just thinking what would be a good advice to, to give to women. I mean, stating and thinking like many women don't get it is not going to help you. So let's just disregard that. <laughs> but I think women should be much bolder. It's not only about, well, ladies, you shouldn't be happy with only getting money. You should get much more. So make sure that you select the part that you want. So for instance, what is it what you need? Is it is growth capital? Then make sure you get the capital from a party that can actually help you grow. If it's to bridge between your startup phase and your and your scale up phase, have a look that you choose somebody who's actually specialized in that phase and can help you get from one stage into another. So be entrepreneurial about your financing, about your capital, be bold. Because if you have thought about what you want in terms of capital, if you're absolutely sure that you've made a good selection, you can pitch it like crazy. And I'm sure if you do it that way, you'll get it much more often. Email me if you don't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when, when it comes to starting a business, people think that money is, is the solution to everything. And, and often it's actually the problem for everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. but the, 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 there is a question that came from LinkedIn from Alice Noel, who just said, should we also be innovating in the social sciences for example, should we be creating the Federation uh, and Starfleet? The Federation and what? And Starfleet. So that's for the for the for the the tricky fans out there. Uh, well, essentially, that's what places like ISU are trying to do, right? You're trying to create a cadre of people that understand the use of uh, uh, certain technologies for a particular domain, and I think that kind of structure will be more and more important. Um, I think we'll need some radical restructuring of the governance model globally uh, because nation states are having a tough time navigating their world. Uh, the UN is having a harder time because it's a co-op of all the nation states. And um, we'll be moving, we think we're moving to more of a city state model. If you look at Trump or Brexit, it wasn't really left versus right, it was urban versus rural. Um, and that's the predominant tension that we'll have throughout the century. If we can lift above that and go to a global level, then you worry about how do we solve the commons. And that's much easier to do in a, in a city state level uh, as we go forward. The thing that I'm most encouraged by is as we get to energy abundance and very soon water abundance, then lots of areas become, uh, we don't need to be fighting over things. Um, and I think that's maybe one of the most powerful trends that we can hope for. Awesome. We 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 almost at the top of the hour. So perhaps uh, 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 he and uh, Marga Salim, if there's anything you want to leave everyone with, uh, in 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 terms of you know moonshot thinking, uh, you know to to encourage people to go out there and actually you know live their moonshot. Well, one thought maybe, if I may, um, because uh, we were just touching upon abundance. Imagine that one hour of the sun equals all the energy we need for the entire world for an entire year. 
So, I mean to say that it's time to shift around your thinking completely. And the new entrepreneurs are the ones to do that. If you're a big ship, you know, you cannot change direction easily. We need the speedboats for that. So I hope I've listened, um, I've been have listening uh, many speedboats that turn into movable adaptive tankers in on term, but that will speed up and will be bold and will achieve their goals. That would be an amazing thing. I've got nothing to say. I think that was great. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I'm a true believer that 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 the future is 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 amazing, is is much better than than what many of us can can even imagine. Um, and uh, thank you very much to uh, to the the team for for allowing me to moderate here. Um, uh, I, we, the the future is female in 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 my books. So what you're doing here <laughs> is absolutely amazing. Uh, support you 100%. So back to you to close us out uh, today. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us here on Zoom, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. We have many uh, uh, people watching from all over the world. Thank you, Marga and Salim and Kevin and again. Um, please join us next week. We'll have our show about quantum physics and quantum consciousness and the nature of our reality. We'll be tackling the question, is quantum, quantum physics responsible for free will in light of consciousness? Uh, I thank you again. Uh, everyone have a great day, evening, wherever you are. And until next time, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>